Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you all to Zoho People's webinar today. In this month's edition of HR Experts Talk series, we have John Ingham with us to share his insights and learnings about employee experience and employee engagement. In this session, he'll under, he'll help us understand the different ways to strategically approach employee experience and employee engagement. So, before we proceed with the session, here's a little introduction about John to those who don't know him. John is an HR strategy consultant and trainer in his new digital strategic HR academy. His work focuses majorly on realigning people management with the future of work. He has also featured the same in his recent book, The Social Organization. John has co-authored a book with Dave Aldrick in which he has spoken extensively about the future of HR departments. He has also created the Melded Network HR model, which is a modern replacement to the traditional three-legged stool HR operating model. We are super delighted to have you with us today, John, and thank you for hosting this session for us. Dear participants, before we move on to the session, please note that you are in the listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the questions tab on your left panel. You can also use the chat space on your left to interact with us and the fellow participants. Thank you. Over to you, John. I'll transfer the session control to you. Thank you, Princey. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Appreciate it. Right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we're going to be talking about experience and engagement. Uh, I'll do my best to make sure this is a um, an engaging session for everybody as well. Um, so we have uh, a few of us have just been sharing sort of where we are and uh, uh, I'm in the UK. So we got onto the weather fairly quickly because it, it tends to be the first thing that occurs to us. Um, so if anybody else wants to um, share where you are and what you're doing and what weather's like, that would be great. Uh, it's always wonderful uh, to know that there are other people um, on the end of a call like this. Uh, I will be keeping an eye on the chat all the way through the webinar. Um, so, you know, keen that we make it as participative as possible. Um, if you've got anything more extensive, uh, please put that in the questions tab. Um, but I'll be um, sort of popping in and out of there. So most of the time I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. And um, I'm so awed by Princey's uh, ability to talk and uh, respond, I think it was to Amy at the same time. Um, not sure that I'm going to be able to do that, but we'll, um, we'll perhaps give that a go. Um, so, yes, yeah, so my focus is uh, a strategic approach to HR, um, helping HR practitioners increase the impact and contribution that they're having in their businesses, and really with that focus on sort of acting at a strategic level. Uh, so having a direct impact on competitive advantage by creating the sort of people and organisation that our businesses need. Uh, so in this particular session, we're going to be talking about uh, employee experience and engagement, uh, obviously uh, not particularly new topics. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to say anything that profound, um, but I think I've got a few new insights. Um, I mean, I suppose the overall conclusion Oh, do I? <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll get into this in a lot more detail later. But yes, the overall conclusion is you need to do both. Uh, I think the way that we uh, start to put those together, um, what I'm going to suggest is perhaps a little bit different from the way that most people um, see that. Um, so hello to Gilbert, Krishma, um, Ariel. Um, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Uh, and I do hope it will be useful for you. So again, yes, please do keep on contributing to the chat and I'll respond to anything uh, that you're trying to share there. Um, Oh, just one more point of introduction before we move on. Uh, this is actually the first webinar in a series of three. Um, so just talking about not being uh, particularly profound. <laughs> Uh, well, you can tell me at the end of the call, uh, but we'll be doing another couple of webinars after this. And, and those are going to be sort of extending into new topics as well. Uh, so even if there's not 
that much necessarily new. It's still important and uh, and clearly strategic as well. Um, certainly in the next couple of webinars, uh, I, I am going to be going very deeply into new territory. So uh, just going back to wanting this to be engaging and participative, uh, keen to hear from you before we uh, get into any detail. Uh, so a poll for you. Um, just really trying to put this into context. Um, and yes, we are talking about experience and engagement. So hopefully you're interested in those topics. Um, so I'm not going to be too surprised if uh, point two on engagement and point six on experience come out as uh, things which you are particularly interested in. Um, but let's see, because yeah, this isn't the only thing that we've got to focus on, clearly. Um, so some opportunities for you. Uh, which one would you say is the, 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 the main opportunity for you? Uh, is it about people being able to do their work effectively? Um, do they have the skills, the abilities they need? Um, will people do their work, which is obviously the one which focuses mainly on engagement, motivation? Um, perhaps it's about a, a particular subset of your people, um, so the, the quality of your leadership. Or is it something different? Uh, so is it more about the way that people are actually organised? Uh, there's an in, a really interesting model around uh, employee motivation called the AMO model. Uh, AMO stands for Ability, Motivation and Opportunity to Participate. Um, and clearly, a lot of people are very worried about the, the skills gap, you know, particularly at the moment in terms of digital skills. Lots of people suggesting that, you know, the, 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 <laughs> there's a vast amount uh, that we need to learn. Uh, or this idea that the half-life of knowledge is increasingly um, short, maybe about three years these days, as in about half of what we need to know to do our existing jobs sort of goes out of date within a period of two to three years, never mind sort of progressing and, prom and, and gaining promotions and so on. Um, is it the way that people work together? Is it the sort of social connections across the organisation, uh, which I talked a lot about last time I did a webinar for Zoho People, if anybody joined me for that? Uh, or is it more about the experience? <laughs> and um, uh, uh, let me show you the results. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to mean by that, because it's very, very easily, um, well, it's, it's very evenly split across participants. Um, apart from that one on uh, ability and capability, which in a sense is sort of my one surprise from this, because that's quite important as well. Uh, <laughs> I might have to reflect on that and see what I'm going to say about it. Um, but yes, good to see clearly that the questions on engagement and um, experience are scoring quite highly, or uh, I'd have had to think on my feet and uh, replan our agenda, perhaps. OK, so thank you for that. Um, and and, and th I mean, this is the main point of doing that poll is to enable me to respond to those points. This is me thinking strategically or this is how I suggest that you think strategically. Uh, again, not just about engagement, but anything that we do in HR and organisations. Uh, and this is a tool, a model I call the organisation value chain that suggests um, we do um, we, we, we go through these series of activities. We use um, well, we use inputs, budgets and time and resources and so on to perform activities. Everything that we do in HR, organization design, organization development and so on. And the reason that we do those is to create outcomes or capabilities in our people and organization. Uh, the qualities and attributes that people and the way we organize them have that enables the business to be successful and therefore creates these business impacts. Uh, the chain is a little bit more complex than is shown. You know, you've sort of got reverse causalities and things because everything's much more complex these days than it used to be. But broadly, that's the sequence that we go through. Um, now, the other thing that I talk a lot about and um, sort of add to this value chain in terms of how HR can be strategic is this idea of the different levels of value that we operate um, at um, and, and this idea of value adding and value creating. So value add is about focusing on the business and aligning HR 
with what the business needs. Ensuring there's a line of sight, an alignment, that you know everything that we're doing in HR has a purpose on uh, generating business success. And that's really been where HR has mainly been focused for the last, well, <laughs> uh, ever since I've been in HR. So it must be sort of 30 years now, I think. Really, ever since, um, well, Dave Ulrich's HR Champions book, uh, bringing in this concept of business partnering, I think was a, uh, the, uh, around the time that we really started to sort of moving from simply focusing on our activities, you know, the old day, day, days of personnel, to um, really focusing on uh, having an impact on the business. Um, so that's good. And, that, um, and we, we do need to do that. We do need to align with and support the business. Um, but, you know, that... It, it, that is what we're doing. If we, if all we're doing is adding value, we are supporting the business. Uh, and if all we're doing is supporting the business, we are still, to me, a support function. So I think there's a new opportunity, well, not, not really new, but increasingly important, above and beyond adding value, which I call creating value. Uh, and creating value still sort of operates through this value chain, but the, the source of energy now shifts to people, to the outcomes in the organization value chain, um, and, and, and looks at how we can enhance and accumulate those, um, th those qualities, those outcomes, in a way that would enable the business to be even more successful. Um, so value adding was about listening to the business and sort of giving the business what it needs so the business can do its thing and create strategic success within the business, creating value is um, looking at how we can grow those out outcomes and then go to the business and say, look, we could do this. We could improve people's capabilities, people's abilities. Uh, we could grow the, um, the skills in our sales function by 5% to enable them to bring in more revenue. Would that be useful for you? Uh, we could help ensure that people are 10% you know, more engaged than they are currently. Um, you know, would that make a difference to the business? Uh, we could increase people's propensity to collaborate with each other. You know, there's lots and lots of different opportunities to create value. So, so creating value is about using our knowledge, our insight, our experience about what makes the difference to people and work and the way that we organize them um, so that we go to the business and we create new value. We offer new opportunities to the business. We create strategic success through what we do in HR. Um, we create people-based business strategy. You know, that to me is being truly strategic. Um, you know, adding value in many ways is still being an order taker. You know, we're doing what the business needs. Um, creating value is about leading the business. That's that's what I, well, I encourage HR to do for our own sake, because I think that gives us a, a more valuable, interesting, important role. Uh, but, I, you know, I think it's um, it, it, it's a requirement in terms of our role within a business as well. Um, you know, we all know these days our businesses succeed or fail based upon our people. Um, that they compete based upon these capabilities which we offer to the business. So therefore, if we're not optimizing the capabilities, the outcomes that we have, we make it more likely that our business will go out of business. You know, I think it's incumbent on HR these days to do creating value as well as value adding. Um, so that to me is the, the real opportunity for ongoing strategic success. Uh, also on this slide, um, value for money uh, is just the, the basic fundamental level of value and um, doing good stuff well, um, you know, ensuring that all of our HR activities, our HR processes work, um, trying to improve their, their quality, introducing best practices, all of those sort of things. It's good value but it's not value that's going to keep your chief executive um, awake at night. You know, it's, 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 it's that sort of transactional efficiency oriented um, value that uh, these days we sort of want to automate and just make sure it, and I'm not, not knocking automation by the way, in a, in a, in a, in a webinar with Zoho people, you know, it's totally essential because obviously if we don't do that well, we can't put in the, the extra focus and investment into those higher levels. Um, but we really do want to spend our time and energy on adding and creating value rather than value for money. The final thing I just want to say about this slide before we move on uh, is just uh, talking a little bit more about those outcomes. 
Uh, I always find it useful to uh, to break those down, to categorize them. Uh, I have three major categories which I use, uh, which are human, organization, and social capital. Um, not necessarily um, very um, liked words. Uh, a lot of people think they're a bit jargonistic. Uh, it may well help to know that when I talk about human capital, I'm not talking about people being human capital. I'm talking about people being providers of that quality, those outcomes, which is human capital, that then the business can use to succeed. Um, so people are people, let's call them people, um, but, but, but people are the providers of the human capital that our businesses need. Uh, the organisation capital is the value of the way that we organise the people. And then the social capital is the, um, the value of the connections and relationships and the conversations taking place uh, between the people in the business. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to get you to do another poll, uh, but just going back to that, just to explain and reinforce those first three things about people's ability, engagement, the quality of leadership and so on. That was all about human capital, the way that people are organized, that's organization capital, and the way that people work together, that's more of a sort of social capital thing. Um, employee experience is a little bit different, and uh, I'll explain a bit more about that um, well, quite shortly. OK, uh, please do remember uh, if uh, you've got any thoughts, comments, questions, whatever's going on for you on, or on any of this, uh, please do um, add to the uh, to the chat. OK, so. Um, so that was a, a, our strategic approach, how we can be more strategic uh, in HR uh, very quickly, because today isn't about strategic HR, it is about engagement and experience. Um, so this is my um, summary of engagement with a strategic hat on, um, and perhaps uh, my explanation of why I think engagement is still very important. Because I do think there has been a shift, hasn't there, over the last, I don't know, five, ten years, the last two years in particular, perhaps, that engagement has become a little bit less um, less topical, less um, sort of prominent uh, than it used to be. And more and more organisations are focusing on experience as well, and, and sometimes even instead. Um, I still think engagement uh, is really important and we need to do it in conjunction with a focus on experience as well. Um, so, you know, most things in HR and business and life in general, I suppose, have sort of pros and cons. Uh, the pros of focusing on engagement uh, is, is that AMO model. Um, you know, we do need motivation, the M, as well as the ability and the opportunity to participate. And, and sort of engagement is about that, that motivation. Um, in many organisations, engagement is associated with annual surveys. And again, these are um, criticised these days for being slow and um, static and, and sort of not very agile because we only do them you know, once a year or once every couple of years. But they're still really important um, because lots of aspects and factors within engagement you know, do sort of take years to change. And there's absolutely no point asking people, are you engaged? asking them that, that sort of today and asking them the same question tomorrow because nothing will have shifted or, or if it has, it's probably just because yesterday was sunny and today's rainy or something. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really going to help us. Um, so we should be asking about experience and, and, and sort of all these new opportunities there are in terms of pulse surveys and um, uh, uh, different um, ways of measuring employee experience and so on. But engagement surveys still have a really important place. Uh, the other thing, it does allow us to correlate the, the outcome of engagement with the activities that we're undertaking to lead to, to that um, engagement. And that helps us sort of understand which of those activities are most important and to invest in those. So, I, you know, I'm still a big supporter of engagement surveys. Uh, I do have worries about engagement. And in fact, um, I, I, I started to express some of these worries at least 10 years ago. Um, largely based upon work on engagement in organisations and just worrying that the term engagement and, and all, 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 also the way that we thought about engagement very often uh, was a little bit limiting because we do define engagement as um, 
you know, what the business needs. It, it is part of those outcomes in the organization value chain. It's it's the, the state or the, the states that we need to create in our people that mean that they're motivated and committed and will want to do stuff for the business. And therefore, the, for the business, it makes huge sense. Of course, absolutely, we want to be people engaged because if they're engaged, we'll get better business results. But what's the benefit for the individual? And And, and I think sometimes perhaps only unconsciously, but people do ask, you know, why should I be engaged? What's going to be the benefit for me? Uh, why do we only run engagement sur surveys when other outcomes are important too? Engagement is important, but there's loads of other things that we could ask about. Um, you know, we could ask people, do they have the skills they need? Um, uh, do, do they feel able to cooperate with people around them? Um, uh, you know, are, are they using their full potential in the organisation? And, and that depends on what's important to the organization. You know, sometimes um, potential is going to be the key thing. I've, I've done this with an organization uh, that was using engagement surveys, but what was important to them was, was ensuring that people were using their potential. And I sort of said, well, you know, why are you doing a, a survey on engagement? Why don't you do a survey on potential if potential is the important thing for you? There's tons of things we could ask about. Um, one of my favorite um, case studies um, uh, organizations doing interesting HR work at the moment is Novartis. You know, they've got this focus on unbossed, being curious and inspired. What do they ask about? Do they do an engagement survey? No, they do a survey on being unbossed, curious and inspired. It, it, it sort of just makes sense. But so many organizations just sort of do engagement surveys without really thinking about what they're doing. And this is the killer, isn't it? This is the key um, issue about engagement surveys, I think um, <laughs> it just doesn't work or it hasn't been working. You know, we've been trying to improve engagement for 30 years. And if you look something like the Gallup, if you have a look at the Gallup engagement survey or, you know, many of the others, you can see sort of engagement levels flatlining for decades. Um, so clearly we do need to do something else. And I think experience is, you know, it's 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 been our main attempt at doing something else. And I think it has been useful. And I think there's still more we can do as well. Um, by the way, I, I, you know, I, I do, I don't know, part of the reason that I wanted to do this webinar is I do disagree with a lot of the things that some people are saying about engagement and experience. And I, I, yeah, clearly, clearly there's a, a difference between them. Uh, clearly they, they are sort of focusing on different opportunities. I think sometimes there's a lot of misleading stuff around. Um, one very well-known commentator you may have come across talks about engagement's all about um, perks. <laughs> so giving nice things to people so that they'll be engaged, whereas experience is more of a sort of an integrated strategy. Engagement's got nothing about, well, it may have, you know, if you do your engagement survey and you correlate your activities to your outcomes and the activities that seem to be most important is giving people perks and give them more perks. But, um, you yeah, know, certainly from a strategic perspective, um, yeah, that's not really the case. Um, yes, yeah, so my next slide was on experience. And again, you know, there are pros and cons with a focus on experience. Um the, the the key thing, you know, it is, it, the times have changed. We live in the experience age. Um, you know, we, we, we need to be more people-centered. People do want experiences rather than sort of products. You know, um, we've reached the age in some countries at least of, of sort of peak stuff. You know, people don't want the stuff anymore. They want to go out and have an experience instead. And I think that to an extent is true in employment. I do think we, we, we misinterpret it sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure that people necessarily want sort of exciting trips and parties all the time, although, you know, sometimes they're quite nice. But to me, the key thing about experience that we're after is, is sort of a meaningful experience, you know, something that helps us and does something which, which works for us, is, is, is meaningful for us. Uh, my second point was about experiences is further back down the value chain. So as I've been saying, engagement is about creating an outcome. Experiences is sort of related to activities. So because it's it's earlier in the value chain, it gives us more ability to leverage the rest of the value chain. 
um, you know, we can do more things. We can influence engagement, but we can influence, you know, how business is done and customer experience and lots of different things as well. But perhaps sort of just focusing on, on, on engagement is a little bit too late. Um, but the con that links to that, I think, is that, um, you know, the business customers still need those organizational outcomes, those organization capabilities. They still need engaged people who will deliver for the business. You know, happy, um, excited people, great, you know, but that doesn't necessarily change the fundamentals of the business. So again, we do need both. Um, the technology we have available to, these, to, um, to us these days helps as well. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the focus in, in, in HR technology has moved from functionality to usability, or at least functionality and usability. Um, and clearly, if you've got both, you know, if you've got a system like Zoho People, uh, which, um, you know, delivers what people need to do the job, but also is easy for them to use, uh, obviously, that's a good thing. Uh, all of the techniques from design thinking, uh, personas, employee journeys, measuring moments that matter, you know, all of these things are hugely useful opportunities and we should um, take account of them. And I do worry that we perhaps over focus on them. Yet again, the organization outcomes are, are, are still really important. And to an extent, it does depend upon the, the nature of the HR process. So, you know, an onboarding process is ultimately about employee experience. You know, if people don't have a good experience doing onboarding, they're going to leave. There is a, there's an element of um, organization outcome, you know, providing the, the right knowledge and skills that they need to be effective as well. But primarily it's about, um, it's about experience. Uh, performance management is completely different. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good if there is a, a good, a positive experience of performance management, but primarily performance management is about enabling people to perform. Um, you know, if you had a good experience of performance management, but people weren't improving their performance, to me, that would not be a successful performance management process. Uh, and my fifth point on that slide was about um, experience being important because it, it, it is another lever, another opportunity to ensure people are motivated or what I'd like to talk about as being fulfilled. Um, because from an experience perspective, and this perhaps is the key thing about experience, experience is something the person has rather than the business has. You know, engagement is a very business oriented term. Fulfillment is something the individual feels if they experience the right sort of environment. Um, which, which is, and it's a shame that you're missing this slide because this is my favorite. You were gonna have a pig with lipstick on uh, because there is this phrase about um, lipstick on a pig, sort of meaning that you, know, you take something that's fairly ugly and you try and make it look a bit, bit more beautiful, but you're not actually changing anything fundamental about it. And, and, and my worry about experience is, you know, that's what's happening here. And um, we're taking sort of clunky business processes um, and we're trying to dress them up a little bit, but that it's it, it's not actually changing very much and um, very fundamental. Um, so I, you know, I think we do need experience and engagement, but I'm going to offer you a different opportunity to combine them in ways that I don't think we always think about. So, um, you know, clearly experience is an activity. Uh, or we experience an activity um, and, and engagement is one of the outcomes. So there is that relationship, but it's it's more than that. It's deeper than that. Um, but I should say that when we're trying to combine them, uh, uh, let's try and talk about employee fulfillment rather than engagement because of that factor I was talking about, which is that engagement is often seen as a little bit disengaging by the people that we're trying to engage. So how do we fulfill people? You know, how do we ensure they're fulfilled? How do we ensure that from their perspective, not worrying about how they're delivering from the, for the business, but simply thinking about them and their life and the work that they're doing. Do, you know, do they feel happy? Are they in the right place? Are they doing the right things? Is, are things working for them? You know, are they, do they wake up in the morning and feel sort of positive about their lives? Are they fulfilled? 
Um, so I just thought it'd be interesting because we're sort of halfway through the webinar um, and I'm not going to do a poll for this. So this is this is just a, a quick response in the chat on a one to 10 scale. How fulfilled are you, you know, in your life and at work? Um, you know, one <laughs> pretty unfulfilled or 10. Absolutely everything is going swimmingly. And I think the question that you might that you might want to respond to at the same time is what would have to be different at work? to help you shift that up, to ramp that up, maybe two or three points. You know, if you're saying on a scale of one to 10, I'm sort of fulfilled of level six, what would have to be different to make that an eight or nine? Um, if you're already at 10, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult, but what would, what would have to happen to make it the impossible 12 or 13, maybe? Just be interesting uh, if you uh, could share that with me. Uh, six and more autonomy. Uh, thank you, uh, Celia. I appreciate that, and and great. It would be great to hear from more of you as well. Um, but these are my suggestions. So, um, um, and and autonomy is 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 here clearly. Um, so uh, we've still got gremlins in our slides, <laughs> um, uh, um, but hopefully you can you can still read them. Uh, and recognition as well, Laura. Yes, absolutely. We're going. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, and um, Ariel, that's an interesting one. Staff departments having better exchanges with each other. Uh, I'm gonna put that down to connection and relatedness as well. Um, so um, all the responses so far relate to this slide. So, so let, me, um, let me explain what I'm trying to suggest here. Um, so yeah, so fulfillment is, is, is intrinsic. You know, engagement is, is more extrinsic. It's things that we're trying to make happen to somebody. But I think in today's more people-centered experience age, we need to focus on the individual from the individual's perspective. Um, and the things which academic theory and research and experience in organizations seem to suggest are most important are, well, firstly, there are there's, there's a number of basics um, which it's a little bit like Hertzberg theory, if, if you've come across that. You know, there are, there are basics which, if they're not there, you know, if people aren't paid appropriately, are going to get in the way. They're not necessarily going to lead to high levels of fulfillment, but they'd better be in place because if they're not, people aren't going to be effectively fulfilled. Um, so, uh, yeah, things like um, flexible working, you know, the employee experience and the way that we've been talking about it, psychological safety and so on. Um, but the three things that really make a difference, um, I think, are, are these. Uh, autonomy, the ability to do things on your own, to develop um, competence, to ensure you're progressing, to get into that flow state, if you've come across that. Um, connectedness, you know, linking with other departments and ensuring that you can do things across the, the rest of the organization and that you've got people that, you know, around you that, you, you do th feel you've got a, a human relationship rather than simply sort of a, a job connection with, uh, and then sort of purpose and meaning as well. Um, so I've, I've, I've displayed these in a Venn diagram, and you may notice that the top two circles are slightly disconnected because I think they are. I, I, I do think there is a, an interesting paradox in these three that um, sort of autonomy and connection do sort of pull in opposite directions. And the way that you need to resolve that uh, or to navigate that paradox is by focusing on, on, on purpose. You know, if there's a strong enough purpose, if people have got that, that North Star behind them, um, then it starts to get easier to have autonomy and connection at the same time. Um, so it's a little bit like the, um, the, yeah, the, the French uh, motto that, um, E equality, liberty, fraternity, you know, equality and liberty also pull in different directions. You need fraternity to hook them together. Uh, the same thing here, I think, in uh, in terms of purpose. Uh, you, you, um, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've come across uh, ideas like this before. Uh, you may even be focusing on these three areas as opportunities to focus on, to develop engagement. And, and, and to an extent, that be, that would be fine. But I do think they're more, they are, that because they are intrinsic, they are more about us being fulfilled rather than sort of engaged from a business perspective. So, I, you know, I, th I think it's helpful to think of them as um, intrinsic states that people can find 
if they're invested in and supported and enabled in the right sort of way. Uh, so uh, just to finish on the slide, oh yeah, so um, this actually does come from uh, a, 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 a something called self-determination theory. Uh, you may have come across it if you read Dan Pink's book, Drive. Uh, he took these three factors, changed them slightly. So he talked about autonomy, uh, mastery, i.e. competence, and, um, and purpose. Uh, so sort of dropped that focus on relatedness, um, but, but yeah, sort of got to similar uh, results. Um, actually, and just on Dan Pink, that he has a wonderful book out uh, just at the moment called The Power of Regret. He's been looking at the sort of core things that people regret in their lives. So again, from a sort of a, a, a personal perspective rather than a business perspective, and he's identified sort of foundation regrets, which sort of equate to the basics that I've talked about. Um, uh, boldness, you know, people feeling they've not been bold enough in their lives, which I think is about autonomy. Um, people having regrets about morals, you know, not always doing the right thing, which I think connects to purpose. Uh, and people having regrets about connectedness, which is obviously that, that third circle here. So quite interesting that coming um, at uh, motivation or fulfillment from that different direction uh, actually gets us to the same sort of results as well. Oh, and recognition. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was really pleased to see that come up in the chat. Um, recognition, really important as well. Um, I sort of see that as a little bit separate because I think the power of recognition is to reinforce those three things. You know, recognition comes from other people and therefore it helps connecting us, uh, particularly if we do recognition around our values or something. It helps purpose um, and it strengthens our own perspective about our our progression, you know, because we can sort of see that other people are seeing what we're feeling as well. And um, so recognition are also really important. So those to me, you know, if we're focusing on fulfillment, these are the three things um, that make the biggest difference. Um, so I did want to just dive into purpose in a bit more detail um, because, you know, that's the hook for the other two things. Uh, and actually, in the next two webinars, I'm going to talk more deeply about autonomy and relatedness. Um, and I'm and I'm not going to talk any more about purpose, though. I, I, I thought I'd sort of talk about it quickly now. Now, obviously, we could spend the entire webinar, the entire day, talking about purpose. Uh, uh, we can't because we've only got 20 minutes left. So just very quickly. Um, so yeah, this is about having a corporate purpose, you know, and 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 I'm trying to show here the way that purpose statements have changed over the last couple of decades. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, most purpose statements were about beating the competition, and then they sort of morphed into. Um, sorry, I think I, I think I um, was cut off there for a second. Um, perhaps again, you could let me know in the chat that you're back with me. Would be good to know. Oh yes, John, we can hear you. Oh, perfect, perfect, wonderful. Um, so I'm not quite well. I'm not quite sure if I was lost or or at what point you lost me. Uh, I was just talking about the change in um, purpose statements, sort of moving on from competing with other organisations. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I think it was probably around the beginning of this that you lost me. Um, so 30 years ago, a lot of purposes were around competition and then sort of morphed into more focusing on achievement. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to benefit society? And increasingly have started to focus more on the organisation. You know, what type of organisation are you? Um, and sort of linking to the employer brand as well. Um, you know, is this a company where I'm going to be able to develop and get really good at innovation or be a, an effective leader or, you know, what is it special about this organization? What does it do? Linking back to those organization outcomes as well. I, th I think that provides a really powerful source and, uh, and uh, an un underused source of purpose as well. Uh, and these days, you know, with increasing focus on the planet as well, uh, a lot of purpose statements, you know, becoming much more socially responsible. Uh, okay. we, we are having fun with the technology today. Wonderful. Uh, I think I'm back. Um, so I just wanted to explain, yes, by having those 
that, that those um, uh, that clear purpose, particularly an organisational or a socially responsible purpose, it just makes it easier for people to find their own purpose and sort of connect their individual purpose with the corporate purpose. And that's going to act as that, that bond uh, between those different elements of fulfillment as well. Um, you know, particularly, and uh, because I did want to talk about the activities that you can undertake within this sort of new requirement for experience and engagement as well. Um, and, you know, so having a clear purpose is one thing. Uh, a lot of leading organisations these days helping individuals um, articulate their individual purpose as well. A wonderful thing to do, uh, because the more you do that, the more, again, you make it easier for people to to link uh, their individual purpose to the organisational purpose and to ensure that they are that they've got that feeling of meaning uh, from the work that they're doing. Um, and personalization as well. Um, personalization wasn't on my slide about fulfillment, but it is sort of embedded behind that in a sense, because um, despite the fact that, and, and this is sort of at the, the, the top of this chart, and, I, and, I, and please don't feel that you need to read the chart, and I'm not going to read it through or anything, but all, all this is trying to show is that there are these top level um, societal trends and, and, and sort of global uh, states uh, that lead to, to the importance of autonomy, uh, relatedness and purpose all the way around the world. But then as you sort of dig down into a particular organisation, there are tweaks and nuances depending upon the organisation culture, the national culture, the professional values of a particular function and so on. And, and you know, as you sort of dig down further and further towards a particular individual, you find, you know, more and more nuances that means for a particular person, you probably will find that um, autonomy, relatedness and purpose are still very important, but there will be differences, you know, there'll be particular nuances that they experience um, that perhaps other people don't. And, and, and that that's the key, that's the, the main reason why we need to focus on personalization. And it's getting easier to do, you know, our, again, our, our technologies uh, are enabling this to take place. Um, but but fundamentally, it's 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 because if we try to engage everybody or try to ensure that everybody is fulfilled and we perform, we undertake the same activities for everybody because people are different as well as all of us being the same to an extent. We're never going to ensure that everybody is fulfilled to the full extent because yeah, you know, everybody has different needs. So to some extent, we do need to get into those needs, and that really is going to be the agenda for our next. Uh, for our next webinar. Um, so another quick uh, poll for you, uh, and oh yes, I'll, I'll launch the poll for this one. Um, and this is this is about for your workforce in general. Um, just thinking about you know across your workforce, and again, you know people will have different needs, um, but for your own particular organisation, which of these would you suggest is perhaps the the the, the main enabler for their fulfillment across the organization is it an expressive legacy people want to make a difference you know they want when they they, they leave your organization they want things to be in a better place than it what than they were when they started is it secure progress you know they want they do want to progress they're not they don't need to become the chief executive um but you know as long as they can see that they're sort of you know taking on more responsibility learning new things then that will be fine uh, is it about individual expertise and team success? You know, they, they want to, to feel that they're achieving and they want the people around them to be achieving with them. Uh, risk and reward. You know, they want to have high challenges that may not always be achievable. Um, but if they do achieve them, they want to be rewarded for doing so. Um, is it about flexible working? You know, for some people it is, well, you know, I'll achieve as much as I can. But the key thing is, you know, if something comes up on the Tuesday afternoon, you know, I need to be able to, work to shift that to Wednesday or something. Um, and this sort of thing about low obligation and easy income, you know, some people do find their sense of fulfillment outside of the workplace. And um, that probably needs to be okay as well. Uh, again, this may be a slight difference to engagement, but from an engagement perspective, we might often have perceived those people as unengaged. 
but if they're fulfilled, you know, and if they're doing the work that we're asking them to do, you know, is that lack of engagement necessarily um, a problem? Um, uh, what else? What else? Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing you the results. Uh, so really interesting. And, and so more um, sort of skewed to uh, a particular result this time than, than the last poll we did. Uh, and the one coming out very strongly being uh, individual expertise and team success, uh, which is great. Um, you know, well, I, I, I think it links to that shift from competition to achievement I was talking about, perhaps. You know, if you can get everybody in the... And we're back. Um, um, yeah, so I, I was showing you the poll results, um, uh, which was um, this one about um, uh, growing expertise, individual expertise and team success. That was by far the, um, um, the, 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 the one that would receive the greatest responses. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really positive aspect of an organization. You know, if everybody wants to, because I do think achievement is is a is a more positive state than competition. So if everybody wants to achieve, to to be doing well, and is thinking about the people around them as well, I think that's that's very positive for your organisations. And um, that survey, by the way, did come from uh, Linda Gretton, um, uh, published quite some time ago. Uh, and if you're interested in this idea of archetypes or personas, because sometimes it's quite difficult to go all the way to individual personalization, so if you can just sort of customize and deliver different uh, approaches to different groups within our workforce, that's quite a nice progression towards this personalization type of, 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 of level. Um, and, you know, these six sort of archetypes provided by Linda Gretton, I think is one way of doing it. Um, the strategy consultancy Bain have been doing quite a bit of interesting work around sort of the future of jobs and so on. Uh, and they've got these six um, archetypes that they published earlier this year as well. Um, so perhaps not so sort of academically based, um, but, but certainly more up to date. So if you're, if you're interested in looking at sort of different archetypes, personas within your organization, uh, that Bain research may be interesting as well. Um, and the two other things I'd just like to add before moving on to the next slide. Uh, firstly, so thank you for completing um, your response to the poll. Uh, interesting to know what your responses were. How confident are you that that is the correct response? Because um, I'm not sure that organisations always know. Um, and we should, you know, we should go out and, and be really interested in what the enablers for fulfillment are in our organizations. You know, whether that's about having conversations with our people, whether it's about using tools. Um, so I was just saying uh, we should. You know, we should go out and find from people um, you know, what their enablers for fulfillment are, uh, whether that's about um, using um, surveys like you know, Zoho survey to find out whether it's about going out, having conversations with people. You know, we should be really, really interested in what does make our people fulfilled. Um, and then I think this is an interesting paradox that once we've understood perhaps what's the core enabler within our own organization, and we really want to go for ta to town on that, but how do we ensure that everybody else working for us that perhaps has slightly different motivators, um, you know, how do we ensure that they are fulfilled as well? Okay. Um, so the, 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 the essence of... Um, what I've tried to show you here is that both engagement and experience are important. Now, we can't just do one or the other. We have to do both. And I think some of the ways that we define and interpret and differentiate uh, experience and engagement aren't necessarily that helpful. Um, my suggestion for how we should see this, and this is why I didn't talk about it, because this was supposed to be on a slide as well. Sorry, I, for I forgot that you hadn't seen the slide. Um, I think the as well as that organization value triangle, 
I also think that we, sorry, the organization value chain. Yeah, so the organization value chain is what we do as the organization. We undertake activities to create outcomes. What we need to be thinking as well is um, what the employee perspective on that is. What does that look like for an employee perspective? And to me, that's about experience leading to fulfillment and perhaps leading to sort of long-term changes for them. And yes, you know, experience is different to engagement, but in a sense, that's not the most important thing. The key thing is that we think from that employee perspective. Um, I'm sorry you've not seen that slide. Um, I'm going to do a blog post or a LinkedIn post, sorry, a LinkedIn post this evening. Um, check out my LinkedIn profile, uh, which is on the last slide uh, in the in my slide set. So it'll be uh, on the webinar. You'll, you'll see it before we finish. Or if you're watching the recording, uh, you can get that from there. Um, and I'll share that slide with you because that, that might actually be helpful. Um, so, yeah, so we need we need to think about fulfillment from an employee perspective, not just from our own perspective. Um, and therefore, and this is, again, this sort of goes back to one of those other slides, which I didn't show you, and therefore I may not have talked about. Um, oh, this was the lipstick on a pig point. This is this is why I was going to show you my pig. Um, I think what we end up doing, I did say this, I did talk about this. What we end up doing often is designing our processes to meet the needs of the business. And then we go and talk to our people and say, how can we make this a better experience for you? But we end up putting lipstick on a pig because we, you know, we've got this sort of clunky business process and we try and make it a little bit more beautiful, but fundamentally it's a clunky business process. I think we need to start designing our whole organization for the needs of our people as well as the needs of the business. So it's, let, we do need to focus on experience and engagement, but the issue isn't the differences between experience and engagement. The issue is the difference between a, a people focus and a business focus. You know, we need to think about the experience and fulfillment from the perspective of our employees. And, and I've got two slides for you um, explaining how I suggest that you should do that. Um, so this two by two, Purpose, right at the, 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 the center of this, first of all, because that, again, sort of hooks everything together. Um, we need to think about what the organization is doing. So the organization capabilities, those are the outcomes in the organization value chain that we need to create, the human organization, social capital. And we also need... Uh, so we need to think about what we're delivering for the business, and we also need to think about what we're delivering for our employees. What are the workforce needs? And not just use those as enablers to improve the employee experience, but to design the whole organization, that we're designing the organization for the needs of the business and the needs of the workforce. And then on the other side of this matrix, uh, we're also thinking about how the organization works. Now, yeah, from an employee perspective, those are our those are our employee values. So most organizations will have those. They articulate how we think, how we'd like employees to behave. Principles are statements about how we want the organization to work from a business perspective. If we can have those four things, we're in a much, much better position to design the whole um, organization to ensure that the organization is going to deliver the organization outcomes that will make the business successful, but will also provide everything that our employees need so they have a positive experience and feel fulfilled as well. So you need to start with these three things. We need to understand the workforce needs. We need clarity in the organization outcomes, and we need these organization principles. These are just really simple statements about what's important in the way the organization works. Um, if you'd like examples, there's a phenomenal book called Principles written by Ray Dalio, which is about 200 principles uh, used at the investment firm Bridgewater. And um, please do not come up with 200 principles for your own organization. But have a read. Um, yeah, it's, it's like half a dozen 
bullet points on the most important things for your organizations. So the values tell your people what to do. The principles express what's important when your managers make decisions about the organization. Um, so you use those three things as the objectives to build your organization. And then you undertake the activities that are going to provide those objectives. And then you can get into the metrics and analytics and everything else. Um, so in terms of engagement, and experience. Let's be clear about what our workforce needs. Why do they want to be employed by our organization? What are the outcomes? What is the human organization social capital that we need to deliver to the business? And what are the principles? What is What are those statements about how we want the organization to work? And then once we've got those, in, in, and obviously because we're focusing on engagement, some of those organization outcomes are going to be about engagement and some of those workforce needs are going to be about fulfillment and let's try to articulate them absolutely as clearly as we can and then we can focus on the activities you know whether that's about purpose or purple personalization or whatever it may be it gives us much more strategic focus to achieve the objectives that we need to meet right um ooh, we've only got a couple more minutes um if there are, if anybody's got any questions please do put them in the chat. Uh, I do apologize that my uh, audio and, vid and video has been sort of going in and out as we've been progressing through this. Uh, I can't see any other questions. So um, uh, we, do, we do still have two minutes if anybody has one. Um, but just to finish, so though that, that to me is, is the, the basic requirement in today's world to deliver a fulfilling employment for the people working for us. Um, there is more, and we're gonna go into the more in these two webinars. And we're, we're gonna do everything that we can to make sure that the slides work and the video is maintained. I think this is probably my end. I think there's something perhaps going wrong with the internet here. But anyway, uh, please do join me again um, for a session Firstly, about meeting employee needs, mainly around that piece around relatedness, and then secondly, um, on uh, employee potential. And we're going to be talking a lot about the economy as the driver. Um, if you would like to know more about me or read more of my uh, insights and so on, uh, you'll find me at loads of different places. Uh, please do check out the academy. Um, <laughs> that's sort of where I'm spending most of my time these days, running an academy. Uh, and as I said before, I will put that slide that you missed uh, up on LinkedIn. Uh, so hopefully you can see that now. Right, we're into our last minute. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Hope that's been useful. And uh, I'll hand back quickly to Princey. Uh, well, that was one interesting session, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's webinar. We hope you found it useful. Also, our next webinar is about how organizations can navigate the great resignation and it will be hosted by John on April 26th. The registration link for the same has been shared in the chat tab. Please feel free to register yourself. And if that's about it. I think we'll wind up. Thanks again for joining us and thank you, John, for hosting this insightful session. Wishing you all a great day ahead and hope to see you all in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.